Hi, I'm Russ Ryden, owner and operator of Fit to Score, a Dallas Fort Worth custom club fitting and club building business. Today we're going to talk about shaft alignment. There is some evidence that having a shaft aligned properly will affect your shot dispersion. This is based on the idea that the shaft has an influence on delivering the head consistently to the ball. Consistently striking the center of the face is going to result in consistent ball flight. A practice used by many club makers is spine alignment. Think of your back. It bends forward easily, but resists bending backwards. Golf shafts are thought to have a similar character to a smaller degree. My reference on this is Dave Tuttleman, a fellow club geek. His website, Tuttleman.com, explores spines in an eight-page article. We're going to get to the heart of it in a few minutes. If you want to know more, read Dave's site. Before we can measure a spine, it would help if we define it. I'm going to borrow directly from Dave's article. It is thought that some manufacturing process, like welding steel or wrapping graphite, causes asymmetry in the shaft, as you can see in this illustration. And this asymmetry, or spine, will influence how the shaft bends. And this can be found by using a spine finder. Now we're going to take a look at some spine finders. Well, we've talked some about what a spine is. Let's take a look at the tools available to club makers to locate the spine of a shaft. This is a bearing base spine finder. It's a tube of metal with a bearing pressed into each end and a flange welded to the bottom so I can clamp it in a shop vise. Today I'm going to be clamping this into my deflection instrument. The shaft is then inserted through the two bearings so it's free spinning. Now I'm going to take a third bearing and I'm going to put that around to the end of the shaft so it's still free spinning and you see this line on the shaft is going to snap to the same spot as I rotate this shaft under load. So what I do is take a sharpie, draw a mark down the top of the shaft, and in a bearing based spine finder, this mark indicates what is believed to be the spine of the shaft. This is another bearing based spine finding device. We have three sets of bearings. In this case, it's a pair of bearings mounted in a pillow block, and you do the same thing. We put the butt of the shaft in between these two bearings and we press the tip of it underneath this bearing putting a load on it and as we spin the shaft once again our black line is coming up to the same spot. We take a sharpie, draw a line down the top of the shaft and again in this bearing based spine finding device we have what is believed to be the spine of this shaft. Here's another device, very much like the last device. The difference here is that I have a load cell attached to a digital display that's measuring the force placed upon this pair of bearings. So just like the last device, I'm going to thread the shaft under those bearings, over these, and load the tip. Now you can't see the black line on this shaft because this is opposite handed and the black line is towards me right now. But as I spin this shaft, I will again feel that spot where it is snapping to what is believed to be the spine. Now if I watch the digital gauge, you can see that as I spin away from the mark that I put on this shaft earlier, the indicator goes up and as I move towards that mark, the indicator goes down, showing me again what is believed to be the spine of this shaft. Now let's look at what we see on these so-called spine finders. Well, it's actually simple. What we're seeing is the bow of the shaft, or as Dave calls it, residual bend. In this example, the shaft has a three millimeter bow one deflected 20 millimeters. In the direction of the bow, it is being bent only 17 millimeters. 
in a direction opposite the bow, it is being bent 23 millimeters. What our so-called spine finders are showing us is nothing more than the bow of the shaft. Let's move on to this idea of spine in a shaft. There is that moment before impact when the shaft releases stored energy and the head moves in front of your hands and the shaft. The consistency of that action can be influenced by asymmetry of the shaft. What he is illustrating, and if you go to his website explaining in great detail, is that an asymmetrical section or spine of a tube or golf shaft will load the same in opposite directions. The spine will have the same effect on stiffness if you bend it upward or downward. Sorry Dave, I know I'm really compressing this discussion. But that is not what we see in the spine finders we were looking at. This is a deflection measurement instrument. It was sold before frequency machines became popular for measuring stiffness of shafts. It has a load cell attached to a digital display. This tower allows you to attach stops and create different amounts of deflection when you want to measure a shaft. We're going to use this to assess the spine or the radial stiffness of the shaft in 10 degree increments by using a protractor. I'm going to attach that protractor to the back of the shaft, tighten the shaft in the clamp, and I'm going to take and deflect the shaft one inch and take a note of that force. Now I'm going to deflect the shaft 5 inches and take another note of the force. The purpose in doing this is to gather the actual material stiffness of the shaft. By subtracting the 1 inch reading from the 5 inch reading, we remove the effect of the bow in the shaft. Now I'm going to take this and I'm going to turn it 10 degrees, retighten my clamps, Deflect one inch again, take a note of the reading, and deflect it five inches, take another note of the reading. Here is a plot of the measurements of this shaft taken every 10 degrees. The two measurements are shown here. The inner ring is the one inch deflection, and the outer ring is the five inch deflection. When I subtract one from the other, we get the difference of the two. The technique is used to remove the bow effect from the measurements. If you look closely, you can see the load measurements are not perfectly round. Let's zoom in. Wow! Now you can see the shaft does not load evenly around its axis. By subtracting a base deflection from the total deflection, we get the stiffness of the tube material without the bow. Yes, the shaft is asymmetrical and look at the uniformity of the asymmetry. Just as Dave explained, the spine creates a strong plane and a weak plane. By now, you're probably wondering where this discussion is going. It turns out there is an easy way to find the stable side of a shaft. It's done with this little tool, a weighted laser pointer and a digital camera. I'm going to set my camera to a two second shutter delay, a five second exposure, and I'm going to clamp it to the arm of my deflection device. The laser tip pointer goes on the tip of the shaft and it's pointing at a board like this one. I fire the camera, deflect the shaft and release it. It will vibrate and the image will show me if I have a stable plane. You can see in this image the shaft is unstable, but the image shows a tendency to move to the stable plane. After a few attempts and adjustments, there we are, the stable plane, called by many club bankers the flow or flatline oscillation of the shaft. 
Remember the earlier illustration, these two red lines actually show the stable oscillation planes of this shaft. As Dave Tunnelman explains, with basic textbook mechanical engineering principles, the flows are about 90 degrees apart and lie along the strong and weak planes of the shaft. So, many custom club makers have this simple tool and technique in their shops. They quickly find and install your shafts with a stable plane towards the target. Let's add orange lines to the shaft we just measured to show the spine finder result. Notice how it is not aligned with either the strong or weak planes. On this shaft, the bow is close to the actual spine, but not exactly on either of the planes. The difference varies from shaft to shaft. Jeff Lucas, manager of shaft engineering at Aldola, calls the stable plane VOP, or vertical oscillation plane. Most club makers with laser pointers use the term flatline oscillation. Whatever you call it, it reveals the stable plane of a shaft in a way that bearing based spine finders do not. So there is an easy way to find the most stable plane of a shaft, and quite often the combination of oscillation and bow finding will show you the strongest of the two planes. For the shaft techno geeks out there, you'll want to measure the stiffness of the two oscillation planes to determine which is strong and which is weak. I should point out that a variation of the process is patented and called SST puring. Does it matter? I've not had the time to personally measure the differences, so what are we hearing from those that have? Well, Robin Arthur, owner of Arthur Extreme Shafts, and formerly the shaft designer at Grapholoy says, one of the things we experimented with a lot was orientation of the shaft. When we orient the stable plane towards the target, we'd get a very repeatable flight pattern. When we would reorient within the same head, the flight immediately and drastically changed and the player had to work at getting a consistent flight pattern. The dramatic nature of the differences pretty much took me even by surprise. Tim Hewlett, owner of My Ostrich, longtime fitter, driving range operator, and one of the founders of the International Club Makers Guild says, we have done testing with flow plane orientation and have results that clearly show a more consistent stenter of face strike with every handicap level when flow was pointed towards the target when compared with flow at 45 degrees to the target or at 12 o'clock. Well, there is no definitive proof that could be published in a scientific journal about the value of shaft alignment. But if you have, as I have, watched the oscillation pattern of shafts off-plane, you would do what I do in my own clubs and get your shafts aligned. 